Hello, this is Ben Leonard, and I'm going to give the first of four uh, presentations which introduce you to the field of tribology. This is Lecture 1, The Terrible Tries, uh, subtitled Getting a Face Full of Tribology. I'm going to begin by discussing what tribology is and then go over some of the size scales that play a role in tribology. What size of things we're looking at? What dimensions are we talking about? Then I will go through the three aspects of tribology, lubrication, friction, and wear. For each of those topics, I will go over some key concepts. And then I will have a cage match, theory versus reality. What happens when you try to put some theories which sound really great into real practice it can be a little bit confusing at first and then there is you'll wrap up with a summary what is tribology tribology comes from the word tribos which is greek and it means to rub so tribology is the study of rubbing surfaces. It has is looks at three different um, subfields: friction, lubrication, and wear. And all of those play a role in um, rubbing surfaces. Wear you're losing material from them. Friction is the resistance to motion, and lubrication is used to control, friction, and wear. Um, fr lubrication, friction, and wear affect performance, reliability, efficiency uh, of machines. Tribology has been around for a long time. Even if it wasn't, even if the word was only invented in the 20th century. You can see on this slide we have a picture of an early tribologist. Here, this is from an old uh, Greek wall painting, and they're sliding a statue of the pharaoh, and you've got someone pouring lubricant out in front so it's easier to pull. Now we're going on to the size scales, which are important in tribology. To give you a frame of reference, a human hair has a diameter of about 100 microns. The fluid film in a ball bearing is about one micron thick. And as we look at this picture here, you see that yes, you've got a gear, but and you look at it and you see, okay, there's two gear teeth that are touching, but then you can zoom down and uh, you see, okay, there's a lubricant film. Then you can zoom down even further. And then you can get down even further and just look at the atoms. So, uh, as time progressed, we've also got to smaller scales. So you've got uni tribology at the meter scale. This is large scale machinery. We started looking at that around 1800. In 1850, we got to sort of desiccant tribology, tenth of a meter. Here we're looking at forces, torques, vibrations. Uh, 1900 macro tribology, millimeter size scales. We discovered the Hertz contact, EHD. Um, then 1950, you've got micro tribology. We're looking at asperities. We're starting to look at elastic and plastic deformation, the effect of debris discovering surface layers around 2000 we get to nano tribology so here we're looking at the molecules and atoms on the surface <coughs> the molecular forces involved and uh, boundary layer and um, uh, intermolecular forces so now we're going to cover friction lubrication and wear well, to begin with, 
So here's friction. So, mommy, where does friction come from? We've got two sliding surfaces. You have to exert some force to get them to move and to keep them in motion. What exactly is resisting the motion between these two surfaces to show up at the top of the slide? Um, the first thing we will do is divide it into dry and lubricated contacts. So in a dry contact, friction can come from two different uh, causes. The first is asperities running into each other and having to push each other out of the way or go over one another, slide over one another. The second is asperity welding. Here the asperities touch, they plastically deform and they, the material on the asperities bonds together and as the asperities move apart that that cold weld needs to be broken, which resists the motion. Uh, in lubricated contacts, we have two different types of uh, friction as well. First is boundary lubrication. Here, you don't have a full lubricant film. The asperities are touching each other, but the lubricant is forming a very thin boundary layer on the disparities, which prevents the metal or the substrate material from coming into contact. It's the lubricant molecules which are actually taking place. The second is hydrodynamic lubrication. Here the surfaces are entirely separated. It's not just a molecular layer. You have a thicker film of lubricant and the shearing of the lubricant, making the lubricant molecules move past one another, is what is causing friction. In lubricated contacts, where we've got boundary lubrication and hydrodynamic lubrication causing uh, friction, the actual uh, relative relationship of those two causes at any point in time is governed by the Strybeck curve. The Strybeck curve, it's uh, used a lot of different places and typically if you do a Google search for this, what you will find is you'll find a lot of kind of characteristic shapes without any numbers on the axes to give you a general trend for what's taking place. Sometimes you might put the film thickness. So as you move from the left to the right here, what's happening is your speed is going up, your viscosity is going up, and your load is going down. So what happens is initially as, as you move from the left to the right, your friction will move downwards. This is because you're getting more lubrication. And so the surfaces move from directly touching each other to having some separation. However, once as you continue moving to the right, eventually the surfaces will be entirely separated. At that point, the friction stops decreasing and starts increasing and this is because it's you are taking taking more energy to shear the lubricant layers the, the lubricant and there's no more asperity contact that's taking place so on the previous slide we showed you a couple characteristic strybeck curves you can find a lot of them just by doing a search on the internet. So what happens when you actually go into a uh, lab and you generate a Strybeck curve? So I pulled a couple figures out from the paper. And on the top figure, we've got a blue line and a red line. And the red line is the base oil, is, is, is an oil. The blue line is a grease, 
that's made using the oil in the red line. And you look at this graph, you say, okay, I'm not sure I exactly see the Strybeck curve we showed before, but it looks fairly close. As you're increasing the speed, the uh, friction goes down, and it looks like the friction is starting to increase back again, at least with the oil, as the speed keeps going on. Okay, that's good. But what happens when we throw in all of the different uh, greases and oils tested in this paper? We look at the bottom graph, and here you see, you see all sorts of shapes doing every sort of thing. You say, what's going on? So, as you can see, the Strybeck curve it works. It's very easy conceptually, but when you go into the lab, you may not come out. Uh, straight away as you are expecting. So where do we start when we're looking at where? What takes place with where? We have two contacting surfaces that are moving relative to one another. And after they have moved relative to one another, some material has separated off from the uh, two surfaces. And so two questions that we might ask in this case is, how fast did this material leave the surface? What speed is this process going on? And if we're interested in that question, what we're generally going to start looking for is a where law that's going to try and relate the parameters that we know to the wear volume. The other question that we can ask is, what happened? Why did that, why did that material separate from our, from our surface? And there, we're going to look at wear mechanisms or wear modes. Those two words are used interchangeably. They refer to the uh, mechanical or chemical or physical processes which lead a part particle or part of the material to uh, leave a rubbing surface. In terms of looking at the first question, how fast are we uh, experiencing wear and solving it with wear laws, one of the best or most interesting sources on this I've seen is Wear Modeling, Evaluation and Categorization of Wear Models. It's a PhD thesis by Meng. And it was published in 1994, so it's not the most recent uh, text that you're going to find. But what he Meng did was he looked at... Um, 154 sliding wear equations and 28 erosion wear equations. He searched the literature between 1950 and 1992 uh, to see what he could find. And he, uh, he found a ton of wear laws. So there's no, he found there's no perfect model that's accurate, quantitative, and can be applied universally. We did see trends in uh, the wear modeling. The first was going from the high level large scale to uh, fine uh, small scale modeling. The second was first was understanding a system and then subdividing it. And then when you subdivide that system, understanding those parts and subdividing it again. The third was it where equations becoming more interdisciplinary. So we also thought he saw three stages in the uh, where equation. From 1950 to 1970, it was generally called it empirical. He saw empirical equations. 1970 to 1980, he saw mechanism uh, proposals, like what type of where mechanism. Then, starting in 1980, he saw interdisciplinary uh, wear equations. So at the bottom I've got a table which lists the number of different equations you found in each category during each time phase. So 
so you say, well, I don't really want to dig through 170 or 180 different papers. There's actually even more now. In the past 20 years, I don't know the number, but a large additional number of where equations have been developed. I just want a standard equation that works. So for that, you're going to use Archer's where equation. This is uh, where volume equals a square coefficient divided by hardness multiplied by the normal force multiplied by the sliding distance. And you can find a lot of different variations of this. You can divide by time or divide by distance uh, to have the equation in terms of where rate. Um, this was actually developed before the uh, time period in which Meng did his thesis. Maybe the most popular because it's the most uh, was first on first to the competition. But you'll see this most of the place, and it works pretty well. So now we're looking at the other approach, wear modes or wear mechanisms. Uh, there's a lot of different types of, well, there's, you can subdivide these, but in general there's four primary wear modes. Um, the first is abrasive wear, and if you want to describe that in a word, you're let's say asperities, cutting. Then you have adhesive wear. They're the asperities cold well together or they adhere together and they break apart and uh, cause wear debris. Then surface fatigue. Here you have cracks forming from either repeated rolling or repeated normal impact. Then you've got corrosion wear, which occurs when you have simultaneously corrosion and sliding, which drastically increases the uh, rate of wear. So, uh, so in each of these, the material is separating from a different, uh, in a different way. So a different approach will be taken to when you try to reduce wear. And you can find lots of diagrams which give you a good idea for understanding what's going on in each case. So if we look at the figures in the upper left-hand corner, we got adhesive wear. Our two surfaces are adhering together, and then you start tearing off parts of the asperities on one surface. You've got abrasive wear. Upper body cuts into the lower body, and this can be from particles or from... Uh, uh, just solid surfaces. Then you've got fatigue wear. Repeated rolling is causing a crack to form. And then you've got corrosive wear, where the corrosion is creating a weak layer on the surface that's getting knocked out of the way by the counter body, and then that fresh exposed surface starts corroding again. So, I did a lot of my thesis on threading wear, and one of the things that people talk about are threading regimes. And there you've got, as your displacement amplitude increases, you go from stick to mixed stick and slip to gross slip and then to reciprocating sliding. And in the upper left-hand corner here, you can see you've got a U-shaped curve. Um, which is the fatigue life. And then you've got the constantly increasing curve, which is the wear rate. And you see, okay, the fatigue life goes down to a minimum, and it comes back up. And you've got the wear rate, which increases at different rates. And you see this figure all over the place. Well, more recently, I came across a, uh, a graph where they have plotted all of the data that was used to generate this curve over top of the wear curve and you look at it and say well I can see how maybe this is a best fit curve for the data 
That is a lot of scatter, especially when it's put on a log log block. So with wear, you're always going to get a lot of scatter. Now on to the third uh, section of tribology, lubrication. With lubricant films, you've got full film lubrication, and then you have broken films. But it breaks the film, asperity is poking through it. So for lubrication, we've got we add together sliding surfaces plus a lubricant. Now this lubricant can be a solid, can be a liquid, can be a gas, can be a semi-solid. And we'll get either hydrodynamic lubrication or boundary lubrication. This corresponds to the two types of friction we discussed earlier, two causes of friction. And you can also be somewhere in between these two extremes. <coughs> the uh, lubrication regimes are used to uh, kind of divide extremes from boundary to um, hydrodynamic lubrication based on the different characteristics that are present. And as we have mentioned earlier, a favorite friend, the Strybeck curve, well, it's back here again. You have an example Strybeck curve on the front, and here it's uh, on the top, and it's showing the different uh, lubrication regimes, where they are on the Strybeck curve, and then it shows uh, different applications and where they operate. So, on the right, then on the right hand side of the curve, or of the slide, you can see a schematic which shows what's going on in each of the lubrication regimes. So we can begin with uh, uh, dry lubrication, or un, not unlubricated contact with no lubrication. This is going to have the highest layer. It's pretty much saying nothing is there. Then we go into boundary lubrication. Here, there's a lubricant, but there's not enough um, velocity or viscosity, or there's too heavy of a load for the surfaces to be separated. So, the lubricant will have additives or the lubricant molecules itself be able to bond with the surface and form very thin films which set, keep the surfaces apart, a protective layer of molecules. Then, we'll go into mixed lubrication. Here, regions of the contract will, contact will be both in boundary and uh, full film lubrication. <coughs> um, so when we get here, then we start seeing the friction decrease. This is an intermediate stage between boundary and hydrodynamic lubrication. When we get to hydrodynamic lubrication, the surfaces are entirely separate. Um, and then we go to elastic hydrodynamic. So get with elastic hydrodynamic, you generally have full film lubrication. Although you can't, will have some asperity contact. But the key thing, and this can be confusing because a lot of stratic curves are not really clear about this. The difference between hydrodynamic and elastic hydrodynamic is not the velocity; it's the shape. The hydrodynamic uh, surface has conformal surfaces, or surfaces that are shaped like one another. For instance, a journal bearing or flat sliding surfaces, so the pressure is relatively low. For elastohydrodynamic lubrication, you've got non-conformal surfaces. The surface, for instance, a ball on a flat or a cylinder on a flat. So you have a very small area of contact and a very high pressure. This causes there to be um, elastic deformation that's on the same order or thicker than the lubricant film. So you just can't solve the problem without taking that deformation into account. So we're going to uh, get into our cage match here. 
On the top of the screen, we've got um, some blue some blue points. These are measured film thicknesses for grease. And then some red dots. These this is the base oil for the grease and uh, the film thickness. And then we've got a green line, which is a theoretically calculated film thickness. You say, wow, this is right on top of the lubricant, uh, uh, the blood oil line, right, what we'd like to see. And then we say uh, our grease, the grease is a thickener, so at lower speed, you wouldn't expect it to hit on the oil line. But as you increase the oil, uh, as the velocity, it hits right up. Everything's working really great. However, when we take the figure here in the, at the bottom of the screen, uh, and if you look at those green triangles, you'd say here's fully flooded contact, which means unlimited lubrication, and initially, boom, our got exactly what we're looking at. However, um, we take a look at all these other lines and they aren't they aren't really uh, matching up with our theoretical curve. Now there's reasons why this is taking place, but if you just throw some lubricant in the contact, start up your machine and start recording your film thickness versus speed, well you're not going to find ex you're not finding exactly what you're looking at. So this can be more complicated in practice than it appears uh, from a cursory look. So I'd like to wrap up this this first presentation. We went over lubrication, went over friction, and we went over wear. Um, lubrication. You're using a solid, a liquid, or a gas to separate two surfaces. Friction, you're moving two surfaces relative to one another. They're in contact. There's a resistance to that motion. Wear, so you start moving your surfaces that are touching one another. You start losing material. Finally, it depends. Does There's a lot of theories, but... Sometimes when you try and apply them, they don't work out quite as well as you'd, um, as you'd hope. So you have to know what's going on here when you try to apply it. So we'll be giving three more presentations in this series. Each one will be going a little bit deeper into these three points, lubrication, friction, and wear. And thank you for taking your time to watch this presentation.